sometimes in life we get so tired, so exhausted just from doing all the stuff we have to do that we forget to rest. In fact, for many, rest feels like, well, like a million miles away. If that's something you relate to, then today I have some good news for you. Really, really good news. Hi, I'm Bernie Diamond, and welcome again to the program as today we take another look at God's rest for you from a different perspective. And please do stay tuned, because in just a few minutes, I'll be telling you about the powerful prayer that could be coming your way to help you through whatever it is that you happen to be dealing with in your life. Just a moment. Well, here we are, Friday again, end of another week. How's your week been? Well, mine's had its challenges, but let me tell you something. Facing those hand in hand with God's been pretty much fantastic. One of the things that strikes me is that the challenges, the challenges can wear you down, seriously wear you down. That's why this week and next week on the program, we're stepping through a series of messages that I've called, Oh God, I Need a Rest. I'm sure there are a few people today who can relate to that. Maybe your ears have just pricked up and you're thinking, hang on a minute, that's exactly what I need, a rest. Well, today I have some good news for you, some fantastic news. God knows the problem. And he wants to give us his rest. Not just any rest, his rest. It's something that sometimes we don't expect of God. We have our spirituality over there in that box, but over here in this box we have our day-to-day life. For many people, they never make the connection between their spirituality, their faith in Jesus, and their day-to-day lives, between God and life, between God and their exhaustion. Well may they exclaim, oh God, I need a rest. But mostly, they don't expect an answer. Today I want to show you that God does have an answer, that he plans to answer and that he wants to deal with our tiredness. This is where the rubber hits the road. Now, if you've been able to join us this week, you'll have heard about God's plan for our lives and how we, humanity, you and I, ended up snatching defeat out of the jaws of victory. In a nutshell, we looked at the creation story in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. God creates all this amazing stuff, the the heavens and the earth and the oceans and day and night and the land and the plants and the animals and you and me. There's this utter splendor of creation. I mean, have a look around. Then he puts us in the middle of it all. He gives the whole thing to us. Everything he's created, and only once he's done that, on the seventh day does God rest. Not because he's exhausted, but to enjoy what he's created, to delight in it. Then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, he calls on us, Adam, to till the land and to look after it. See, work and rest. A perfect plan, perfect relationship with God. But as we know, and this is the point we arrived at yesterday, if you're able to join me, then we blew it. At least Adam and Eve did. They did the one thing that God told them not to do. They ate that apple from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, smack bang in the middle of the garden. And at that point, everything turned to custard. All of God's good and perfect plan for humanity started to unravel. And in particular to the man, God said, reading from Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, to the man he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. So we go from a good and perfect plan to toiling and suffering. That's what happened when humanity rejected God. Look around the world. Sin ushered in pain and suffering and toiling and exhaustion. That's the bad news. But now, now here's the good news. The good news is that God wants us to experience his rest. And that rest, that peace, has everything to do with us living in obedience to him. Have a listen. The writer of the New Testament book, Hebrews, has just gone through a fairly lengthy explanation of how the rebellion of Israel during the exodus in the wilderness stopped them from entering God's rest. Have a read. Hebrews chapter 3 for yourself. Now, let's pick it up in Hebrews chapter 4. Have a careful listen. Therefore, while the promise of entering God's rest is still open, let us take care that none of us should seem to have failed to reach it. For indeed, the good news came to us just as to them. 
but the message they heard didn't benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, as I swore in my anger, they shall not enter my rest, though his works were finished at the foundation of the world. For in one place it speaks about the seventh day as follows, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place it says, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains open for some to enter God's rest, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he sets a certain day today, saying through David much later in the words already quoted today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak later about another day. So then, a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labours as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through disobedience such as theirs. Now the logic in that passage well, it might feel a little bit convoluted, but he's effectively providing an argument that they would have understood in their historical mindset back in the first century. That's a little bit more obscure to you and me here and now. But here's the gist of what he's saying, that God's indeed saying to you and me here and now that all the Israelites, all of them, hundreds of thousands, perhaps well over a million, who fled from Egypt, all of them bar two, perished in the desert before they get to the promised land. They failed to reach the promised land. They failed to enter into God's rest. Why? Because of their disobedience. Let that stand as a lesson to you. Disobedience means that we don't end up in God's promises, in God's rest. And the punchline, the whole, the whole point of what God's saying to you and me right here and now comes in the last couple of verses. So then, a Sabbath rest still remains for God's people. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labours just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through disobedience such as theirs. God's plan is for us to know a rest that goes way beyond a day or two off each week, a rest that goes way beyond a week or two off on holiday somewhere each year. It's a deep, abiding, peaceful rest, a blessed rest from toil and trouble. The sort of rest that can happen in the middle of the most terrible of life storms where we experience a peace that just doesn't make sense because it comes from God. All the burdens we've been carrying just lift off our shoulders and we don't have to worry about them in the world anymore. That's what God means by his rest. It's not me off on some flight of fancy. This is exactly what God says to us in his word. Have a listen from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 28. Haven't you known? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, that exactly is what God promises us. So I don't know about you, but I think that this is great news. It's a fantastic place to finish off the week. And it's good news that we'll be talking about a lot more again next week on the program. Before we go, I'd just like to remind you that if you have a prayer need, we would love to pray for you. Listen, the only sort of prayer that the Bible teaches about is the sort that has powerful results. Just let that sink in. The only sort of prayer that the Bible teaches about is the sort that has powerful results. So if you'd like us to pray with you, in fact, if you'd like our whole prayer community to pray with you, stop by online at powerfulprayer.org to share your prayer request. It's completely confidential. Your name won't be displayed. And in fact, while you're there, perhaps you could pray for one or two others and leave them an encouraging word as well. The Bible says that the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. So let us pray for you and with you. And let's just see what God does, how he intervenes, how he chooses to bless you. That web address again is powerfulprayer.org. I'm Bernie Diamond. I'll catch you again same time Monday. 
with a different perspective.